Wednesday at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern. A high-definition broadcast on Facebook. Focusing on camera line tutorials with our... Test Protesto. Back to the basics live. New videos every Wednesday. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Back to Basics. Tess Protesto here with... Paul Richards. Today is all about live streaming sports. We reached out to our user group and asked them to share some clips and videos, pics, mostly of their live streaming sports setup. We got great feedback. Yeah, we have eight experts in the live streaming sports arena, let's call it. And uh, we're going to try to, we try to curate like the different um, viewpoints because there's so many different viewpoints. Some are extremely professional in the streaming business, all the way up to the Olympics. So from K through 12, uh, education, you know, just uh, let's call it elementary school sports, all the way up to minor leagues professional and Olympic level sports. All of it's being live streamed today. And we have some really interesting perspectives and some tips from, I think the tips are really going to be the most important thing today. Absolutely. Everybody loves a good tip. And we've got tips in spades here. We've got tips from eight different industry professionals. Um, we have, the way our agenda is going to go is we're going to talk a little bit about the camera settings. So just in general, it doesn't matter what camera you have, but we will consider PTZ Optics cameras today. Um, what are the ideal Hopefully. settings for live streaming sports? Then we will go into our tips from experts, which try to curate all the tips and starting with kind of beginners and then going into the more advanced, like really thinking about the entire industry. Uh, really great stuff. And then all the different levels, some pictures from our customers. And without further ado, let, let's introduce our eight industry experts. So we don't have them live here, um, but we have Tom Sinclair from Eastern Shore Broadcasting. That's easternshorebroadcasting.com. He's going to share some really great tips. He started live streaming his kids' soccer games with a webcam back in the early 2000s. Back in like 1917 or something. <laughs> but Tom's a great guy. A lot of you know him from Streaming Idiots. He has some great tips for us. Then we have Rick. This is, uh, I'm trying to say his name Vander right. Whalen. Vander Whalen. And Rick Vander is Whalen. a serial entrepreneur from Indiana who actually retired and stumbled into webcasting and uh, streaming sports kind of as a hobby and now is becoming one of really the industry experts in this online streaming. You know, not, not uh, television production trucks, but we, what he's going to tell us in a little bit is that you can do pretty much 90% of what the big television trucks can do, production trucks, on your own using you know some of the techniques that we're going to show you today. So that's going to be a great uh, episode. The next is Christopher Sabato. From Willamette University yes. out in Oregon, Salem, Oregon. Mm -hmm. Live stream sports All kinds with of sports. a super tall... Tripod set. Yes, we're going to show you right? Christopher. Uh, we have a clip from Christopher's outdoor enclosure. So in Oregon, you never know when it's going to rain. There's mm -hmm. a lot of precipitation. I think he's responsible for all of the sports live streams. Yes, I, I just, actually have written down he's the assistant athletic director of media. <laughs> I wanted to get that right. I'm uh, in and it's in the Will Lamet. Will Lamet. Will Lamet. Damn Will it. Lamet, Paul. <laughs> so Will Lamet University. Then we have um, Ken Benedict, and Ken is from KB. Let me see, KB Productions out in sunny California, and he's going to give us a couple tips for live streaming sports as well. Uh, so we're getting a lot of different perspectives here. Then we have William Warfield. He is the CEO of PrepSpin. Uh, he shows us how he actually does some really cool wireless camera transmissions. Uh, he's going to tell us a little bit about fiber and how to use an extra fiber strand. Sometimes it already run out to the scoreboard, um, and he's doing uh, minor league baseball along with all kinds of um, high school Tennis? level and college level sports. Ken? That's, um, that's oh, William, William Warfield. Ewitt Klink, who is actually from the Netherlands, uh, has showed us how he did some, I think it's minor, minor league level soccer, and he has a drone footage of his setup oh, he's going to show that. us. Yeah, oh, wait, no, I do remember this. That. that was a great clip. Ewitt's great. Then Ryan oh, Vance. Great pick. 
Ryan Vance is from Marshall University in West Virginia. Oh, okay. And they've got a really extensive setup. They've there. got an extensive football setup, and Ryan was able to give us some great tips. And then finally, Joe Calabrese, he's in charge of 12th End Sports Network, and they use 12 cameras. Funny, 12th End Sports Network. 12 cameras, 6 PTZ optics, Spitting. 6 Sony cameras to live stream the... The um, curling? Curling. The Olympic curling. And he's also the winner of the 2017 Streaming Awards Live Sports. Yes, really excited to have uh, a winner on board here. He was like second place overall. He's a winner in more ways than one. Yeah. <laughs> that was, and I can't wait to do the 2018 Sports. Uh, streaming awards it was so much fun so we also have our live you solo here we're going to unbox and show which is cellular bonding and that ties into something that rick was mentioning so um and we're already getting some questions here Raphael is saying fast moving oh, sports just chime in uh higher end frame rates and that's Let's jump right into that now. There is a question from Gene, though, if you want to cover that. All right, sure. We'd love to ask you guys how to deal with iMag and streaming together on the same machine. And Gene, you and I have talked a little bit about iMag in the past, and I'd really love to have a whole Back to Basics episode dedicated to that. Yes. So with all due respect, we're going to skip that question knowing that we're going to cover it in a lot more detail coming up soon. So camera settings ideal for live sports. Let's jump into the presentation. So one of the things that everybody knows is high frame rates because with sports we got a lot of moving parts, right? There's moving pucks, balls, all kinds of different things are moving together and we want to have the um, the fast, it's actually, I think it's just, I think it's just number rate. three, slide three. Um, operating, so what we want to do is, is probably 60 frames a second. And there's a rule of thumb, when you're using 60 frames a second, you probably want to have a shutter speed that's double, um, double it. So, and what I mean by double it is if you're using 60 frames a second, 1 one twentieth, one one hundred and twentieth of a second shutter speed is ideal. So if you're using 30 frames per second, then you would want to do 1 60th of a frame. And that actually is because humans are creatures of habit, and we've grown to like 24 frames a second from Hollywood. Watching Hollywood films, it feels very natural. Um, so, you know, w with sports, it's no different. Uh, so we want to have faster frame rates, but we also need to adjust the shutter speed so that everything looks smooth and natural. So that means you're going to have to work on your aperture. And just if you're looking at your aperture, these are just some notes to take down. If you go to ptzoptics.com slash sports, you can download this whole guide for later. But a large f-stop or a small aperture will keep things into um, into focus in, in long distances, which is what you probably want for sports. And it looks like faster frame rates is one reason that ABC and co-owned ESPN adopted 720p60 for HD. Wow. And our newest firmware for PTZ Optics can now do 720p at 120 frames a second. So I'm really interested to start playing around with that. We're going to do some slow motion and sports streaming in the near future, maybe when it gets a little warmer. Um, Little quick tip, and Tom Sinclair is coming up next with some really great tips on operating the cameras and controlling the cameras. Uh, he's going to give us tips from an operator perspective and from a director perspective. Okay. But in general, if you're operating a joystick, um, let the play develop. And more on this in the next slides, but just remember that people want to see everything. People might even be more intently watching the game than you are. So give, give space, and if you are going to zoom in, make sure you have another camera to snap back to and transition right. to quickly because people want to see... Um, they want to see some close-ups because it makes it professional and makes it feel more intimate. And actually, uh, I think it was Ken Benedict who, who mentioned that, but make sure you have those wide shots to let the play develop. Um, finally, multiple cameras in live streaming sports is really necessary because it's just it's impossible to capture everything without a couple. And different just like you said, if you want to have one camera on a close up, then you have to be ready with another camera. Yeah, and and that gives the producer options, and you really need a producer and multiple camera operators usually. So that covers the settings. Those are just some basic settings. Everybody knows that. Let's get that out of the way because there are some brand new streamers out there and you guys are going to get some great advice from Yeah, Troy says, these I need the show before Back to Basics. <laughs> well, hopefully we're going to be covering some very basic stuff and actually, um, so Tom Sinclair, we've mentioned everybody. Rick Vanderweilen is independent. Christopher, all of these guys, let's dig into it. And Christopher Sabato, 
from Willamette University, um, or Willamette Uni- University, um, has some of the best advice for beginners that I want to jump right into. And he says, and this is like two more slides in, um, that basically um, it, it's all about thinking, this is just from a very basic perspective, if you're just starting out, it's try to understand your audience's expectations. Are they expecting nothing at all? Like, are they not even know, like thinking that, that even it's going to be even streamed? Right. And if that's true, then anything is better than nothing. So a lot of professionals may, may tell you, you know, you got to do it right. And if, you, if, if you're not doing it right, then it's not worth doing at all. And while that is a very good rule of thumb, now this, these are Christopher's words, it's not always the best answer. You know, like uh, we actually interviewed Christopher and um, learned that he live streams for a lot of parents. Remember that? Mm-hmm. And the parents, if, if there's no live stream, they don't get to see their children right. play. Right, so even if it's low quality, they appreciate just being able to see it at all. Yeah, and I think the gist of what he's saying here, you know, anything is better than nothing. And, um, you know, j- the ability to live stream is so much easier than it ever was. Um, so getting out there and just getting something up, every live streaming person and setup that I've ever seen, it always grows and transitions and you add something and add another microphone mm-hmm. and you watch your own content and then decide, okay, well, I wish I could have had this to do something differently. So it always grows and changes. So just know that getting started in any type of way is a good step forward. So Ryan has some great advice. I wanted to start with him. Um, always allow more time than you think to get ready. Yes, and then some. We could <laughs> vouch for that today. Yeah, we were running a little bit behind today. Don't get too comfortable because something always happens. Something always needs to be changed. I saw a question about lighting in there. Lighting is always different, especially, especially when you're outdoors, outside. Especially outdoors, <laughs> streaming sports. It's always crazy. So, so, so just, just be prepared. It's going to make you feel more confident. And one of the things we've always had, if something does go wrong, don't freak out. Don't cut the stream. Breathe. Don't cut it unless it cuts Have itself. someone to help you and get through it because it's, it, it, there's, it's not something to stress out about unless you're really being paid. Uh, if you're doing this for free, you're doing it pro, pro bono or you're doing it to, so that parents can see at home. They're, 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 you know, just think about... Don't pull your hair out. You're going to get through this. So that kind of goes into the second advice here, which is... Don't overthink yeah. or overproduce. The viewer's more interested in the game than anything else. So as long as mm-hmm. they get to see it, they're happy. Don't distract them with a bunch of pictures. I mean, if you're doing advertisements, I understand that you're trying to do ads. That makes sense. But um, try to respect it. And, and there's a huge need for quality content out there. And there's a huge need for streaming sports. There's so many sports that are going unrecorded, unstreamed, available to the public. And there's something about live streaming sports in particular that people just love to watch even more than a I show mean, like this. Yeah, it's just the history of watching live sports, it's professional sports. We're used to it. Yeah. We're comfortable with it. And we just grow to love it. So it's, there's so much opportunity out there. And then Ryan's saying, observe the 180 degree rule. Don't break the plane and it makes teams switch directions. Yeah, Corey's we, chiming in here. Yeah, Corey's saying quality doesn't matter to many people today. Look how many people try to live stream by just aiming their iPad in a general direction. Yeah, and, and by the having good quality... Um, you're going to stand out quite a bit, and it's going to be it's going to make you people want to come back and subscribe. So our next slide, I think, is jumps into to Ken Benedict here, and I love this one. Have a backup for anything that you can afford to have a backup for, and I have to vouch for this one, especially cables, because cables aren't that expensive. But every once in a while, one goes bad, or it's not long batteries. enough. Batteries, batteries, all the things that you can afford to have a backup. Have a backup bag, and definitely. Uh, it makes you feel more prepared, more confident. Mm-hmm. And then keep your camera shots wide enough to see the surrounding players. And that's a great tip because it also allows you to let that play develop. You don't know where they're going to throw the ball. You don't know where they're going to suddenly kick down the field. Have so, that wide shot available at yeah. all times. And we've got some examples of the wide shot um, 
in some videos we're going to show soon. Now, Tom has some great practical advice, as always. Mm -hmm. uh, but one of them is camera guys should use zoom more than pan. Pan tends to get very blurry very quickly. And zoom does seem to focus better as well. So if you're going to zoom into a play, um, you know, panning and trying to track around might not be your best option. Zoom into a play and have that wide shot available as a transition. Yeah, or even zooming out if you have to in a GIF. Yeah, I think he's saying will be right. easier than while you're zoomed in trying to chase the person. Yeah. I like that idea. That's a good idea. That's really good. And then, again, just kind of reiterating, camera guys should not attempt to follow the ball. Just follow the play like mm. a punt in football. I like that. Yeah, because you know, it could get really difficult to follow the ball all the yes. time. Follow the larger play in motion. And, uh, and then the producer's job is to say, oh, wow, that close-up looks really good. Let me cut to it for a second because he's got the ball, he's got the ball, and then boom, cut back. So wow. maybe have one person doing close-ups and definitely one person always following the play. Seems like the last one is something that that's everybody's agreeing upon. Make sure that you have all of your cameras on one side of the field. Yes. Or with the Whatever exception the, uh, of um, the camera that's on a person like a coach or a spectator. That's the only exception, Or if you really. want an audience shot or something like that. Or if you have a band, maybe, in the stands. Yeah. So that's a great one. I didn't realize that. I had no idea. So this is great I never thought about practical that. tips. Yeah. Unless you have a flyover cam. Yeah. Oh, well, those are cool, too. Mm -hmm. And those kind of break it up a little bit. But it still, I don't think, passes the 180 line. Maybe a little. Um, so next slide from Tom. Tom gave us six tips, I believe. Directors should have cameras that show different things. Rookie mistake is to have two cameras showing exactly the same shot. Made that mistake once or twice. Yeah, I mean, maybe the one for the tight shot and the wide shot, but you might want to have one on the benches or something like that. Is that what he's talking about? Yeah, and you know, it's interesting in today's day and age of pan, tilt, zoom cameras, every camera can have 10 different preset positions where you click a thumbnail of exactly where you want it to go. Mm -hmm. So in today's day and age, you know, it does take a little bit of learning, a little bit of time. If you have real cameramen, you kind of have to have a plan. But if you have automated, remotely controlled pan, tilt, zoom cameras, the producer actually can control the cameras with the click of a button in VMAX. Right, and if you switch from one shot to the other, you could press a preset, cue a preset on the other camera that's not live at the time. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty easy. So it's definitely changing a lot. And here it says, directors should not switch cams frequently and a lot. It confuses the viewer. I totally agree. Don't get like click happy. Yeah. Transition you, happy. With sports in particular, you, you know, you might have more freedom in a live show or, you know, if you've got a lot of well, maybe like a panel or something. But in sports, they don't want to see a bunch of camera switches mm -hmm. unless it makes sense. That makes sense. And then no finally, compression should be used on the announcer mics. They get excited and they shout. Interesting. Yeah, like, that's another oh, good one. Yeah, something, expect something some shouting. Yeah. When, you're, when you're tuning those mics, you, you know, you got to expect some shouting and that compression will help to keep them from peaking and, and going off. Wide angle is interesting. NFL doesn't allow the full 22 shot because plays are protected by IP laws. Wow, I didn't know that. Finally makes sense We're to me. We're getting some tips from the audience as well. Always train your camera people to shoot the streaming, which is different than for TV. Wow, as yeah. well. Stream, the streaming world is different. We don't have to go by all the same rules. And just like a few people said before, John saying that that don't cross the line, the 180 degree rule is kind of a standard for all broadcasting. Wow. We break the rules from time to time, I will say, because we have one back. We have these over-the-shoulder shots. For something like what we do, breaking the rules a little bit, I think, is okay. We like to show behind-the-scenes um, stuff, too. Behind-the-scenes, over-the-shoulder shots. We break the rules just a hey, little. William. But um, not always. But sometimes breaking the rules just a little bit, like something like this, does help um, kind of bring you guys into our thought process and show the whole studio. But I get it. <laughs> Um, I do get it that this, especially for sports, that 180 shot is super ideal. And Raphael is saying, depending on the sports action cameras, should be different shot angles, wide, long, medium, and so on. Always follow the main interest of focus and the main action source of interest. And from what Tom is saying as well, you know, keep 
the ma- if you can keep one camera on the focus of interest as long as possible until you have to change shots, um, people understand that you have to change shots, but keeping uh, the focus on a single camera is going to help a lot as well. Okay, so that was Tom. Thank you so much. Um, Christopher chimes in about audio and, of course, saying any audio is key for any broadcast, but sports are no different, and great video and crappy audio will have people tune out automatically. Crappy audio with good video, or crappy video with good audio, people might still stay because they can at least hear the play-by-play. Right. Um, Christopher actually provided us with a wiring diagram of how he does his play-by-play setup. And you know what play-by-play is? Um, I didn't know. No. So play-by-play is actually having a person with a microphone watching the show going, and the ball going down the field. And like now an like every play. Gotcha. There might even be two people, you know, back and forth. Oh, like look at that, look radio, at that. Radio, sports broadcast, and you really have to talk about it. Oh, yeah. play-by-play. So that's what a play-by-play is. And a good play-by-play person is important, but the bare minimum which again, Chris is giving us some very good like beginner tips, is to have the crowd mic there so you can at least hear the crowd, the whistles, and the PA announcer. That makes the stream more watchable. And really great, simple advice. And then he's got an audio advice too, that's very just simple, practical advice. The next step would be to hardwire the PA directly into the broadcast. It's not as good as having play-by-play, but it's an improvement over just having a crowd mic. So very good practical advice. The next slide, Chris, helps us with video and this is a great example we've already talked about kind of how to control the ptz cameras how to control your cameras when to switch what about when we're inside and there is a um what am i thinking of scoreboard well when there's a scoreboard for sports clocks whether it's football basketball or soccer you can incorporate that clock into the broadcast it's obviously best to have a full cg score bug which is great, but it can be very costly and difficult to set up. A simple way to get started is just put a camera on the clock and then crop it out and put it in the corner That's of your broadcast. That's what's done here in this image. Yeah. Cool. So obviously Top the scoreboard's right not right there, but it looks pretty darn good. And Christopher's actually going to show at the end of this presentation, I saved a little trick a on how to use the new tech NDI to bring it in as well. It's a way to do that without creating some sort of data source. Scoreboard yeah, no need for any complicated data sources. Just put a camera on the scoreboard, crop it into the corner of your broadcast, and you don't even have to manage the scoreboard. It's all kind of hands-free. So great for small teams, people who don't have someone to do the scoreboard. Right. Now, Joe uh, Calabrese from 12th End Sports Network, he's from Fairport, New York, um, he has, tw- uh, I think it's actually, I was going to say 12, it's 14 cameras that he uses. And he says, use similar cameras. They use six PTZ Optics cameras and eight Sonys. This way, each of the cameras have similar settings, and it's much easier to make them all look uniform. So that makes a lot of sense. Use headsets and cough buttons. We use Henry Engineering talent pods. Talent pods. Your sound to be, will become more professional, and your talent can control their own levels. Very interesting. Wow. Dropping a lot of knowledge here. But they have to be responsible then for their levels. I suppose so. Yeah, you might be giving a little bit of control to the talent that okay. maybe you, if you don't want to give them control. I'm sure you still have master control back at the broadcast. But um, that's very interesting. Mm. The, here's one that I'm glad, I'm glad you threw in there, Joe, if you're watching. Test, 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 and then test again. Mm-hmm. Uh, be sure that your destination is receiving your stream and Especially that you can be heard. Especially if you're filming an Olympic event or broadcasting yeah. an Olympic event. <laughs> I mean, you definitely want to test that one out. Uh, no matter who you are or what you're doing, test it at least a couple times before you go live. Here's a couple of really great tips from Joe. One of these tips, the fifth tip, I couldn't believe, but let's do number four real quick. Automate as much as you can. He uses vMix shortcuts, auto hotkeys, and scripts when possible to automate the process. They even use an Xbox controller and two X key units tied to their shortcuts. Do um, you want to read the comment? Yeah, a lot of great knowledge coming from uh, the chat. Jim says a play-by-play announcer describes the action of the game as if on radio, but a color announcer jumps in between actual plays with comments on the action of the game rather or other insights. Oh, I see. Like they have like statistics We're sometimes. So like, you know, they'll say, oh, you know, batter A usually bats oh, 300 okay. against Brian, this term. Uh, yes. Brian is saying, clarifying for us, they have yeah. control of their own headset levels, uh, not the outgoing. And Brian's with uh, 12th End Network. Oh, great. Um, so. 12th end sports. Now, number five here, I, I, I think we're going to have to do a whole show on this. 
uh, on the Stream Geeks channel because it was so cool. Use replay to push clips into uh, plays to social. So they use Dropbox and oh, Zapier yes. to push clips to social media. And it takes a little preparation. I did this myself last night because I had to figure it out. So basically, Zapier is, an, is a, a service that can connect different social media platforms. And so Dropbox, you can have two folders. You can have a picture folder and a video folder. And whenever a picture goes into the picture folder, automatically post it to Instagram, mm. Facebook, and Twitter. When a video goes into the video folder, Weird automatically right. upload it to YouTube. And then from YouTube, you can go to Google+, Facebook, and um, Twitter. So automatically, with, if you've camera. got a great little... There's Brian there. Um, I just couldn't believe it. Especially, this is incredible for sports also great for other types of streaming, but to be able to take a goal or that one thing and have it automatic, a 30 second clip automatically post. Right. Just, that is really just cool. great. And you can automate those scripts to say, here was where you can see the show live. You can name the files and stuff. There's a lot of cool stuff you can do in Zapier. Thank you for that tip, Joe. What a cool one. It's a good question. Um, the it's it's an API. I looked into it. It almost feels as if you're uploading it yourself. It's just automated. Um, so it was quite interesting. Uh, so we'll look into that uh, in more detail hopefully soon. Final tip from Joe: use as many close-ups as possible. It makes the cast more personal. So it goes a little bit against what we've been talking about a little bit, but what he's saying here is that when you can, maybe during you know like the, the perfect example would be if there's a, a, a a hockey player in the penalty box. Mm -hmm. You know, get the close up, get make it reaction. feel personal. Mike gives a good tip regarding that. You know, the zoom ins are great, but don't jump from a zoom into a zoom in. He says, zoom out in between. Yeah. That's a great tip. And the other thing a lot of sports broadcasters do, I'll just throw in there quickly, is they use stingers. A stinger is a transition that kind of comes together, and then when it opens up, it is transition to the next clip. Mm -hmm. And I, what I realize is that what most broadcasters do is during the play, during the live um, sporting play, they're doing cuts, right? Cut, 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 cut. But then when the sporting play is over and they go to a replay or a commercial mm. break, that's when they do the stinger. Mm. So when you go from um, a, like a whole bunch of pl a play where you're using traditional cuts or fades, probably cuts are really more professional, then you can do the stinger because then you're kind of prepping the audience for, okay, stinger's coming in, now we're going to a different type of media, whether it be a replay or a prepared video, an advertisement, or a commercial break. Boom! <laughs> Use the stinger exactly the way it's supposed to be used. <laughs> There's Love it. Now we finally get into some of the more detailed tips from Rick. And I talked a little bit about Rick. Rick um, has always, he was actually elected in his high, school his high school's Hall of Fame, honored as a distinguished alumnus in Purdue University and one of the 100 most influential businessmen in Indiana. He started webcasting in 2004 when he landed a contra contract to webcast all NCAA national championships, not televised, by their TV partners, CBS, Turner, and ESPN. So he went from zero to one of the most prolific sports webcasters in the U.S. instantly. At some days, he had seven full crews webcasting seven national championships simultaneously. Wow. They parlayed that into the development of webcasting services for several colleges and D1 college conferences, and now they're on the leading edge in all aspects of web, web streaming and sports streaming. So some of these tips are more on the business side of things, but I love some of these tips. The first thing he says is revenue isn't easily attained from advertisers. Being paid to produce by others is the best business model. So if you're out there trying to start a business in streaming sports, um, working with you know the teams or a local business is probably your best, yeah, your best bet. Understood. The next one, this one uh, really hits home for me. You can produce almost 90% of what the big production trucks can produce with 10% of the cost. Stay simple with the graphics and refrain from complicating the show. We've heard that a few times. Mm -hmm. Broadcast quality made affordable. <laughs> and it really does play into, you know, with what we do here, allowing a single operator to, to control multiple cameras and either, even furthering this idea of being able to do more with less. Absolutely. 
Next he says, get good cameramen. Everyone thinks they can run a game cam, but unfortunately only 10% can. And wow, that comes from perspective. Um, you know, I've seen, we're going to show some footage today of a professional soccer game produced with three PTZ cameras. And I have to say, they, it, the first few times I saw them do the soccer um, game, uh, it looked a little bit robotic. And that's one of the problems with remotely controlled pan tilt zoom cameras. Mm -hmm. But apparently they're going to roll this three camera streaming system out to every soccer, um, you know, major league soccer in the U.S., which is like, I don't know, 30 different stadiums. Crazy. So, um, and it's in the, it's in the, it's in talks right now. But does it look robotic? A little bit, depending on how you use it. If you do what Tom Sinclair did and just do zooming in and zooming out or very slow pans with, with at a full zoom, zoom out, it looks pretty good. So knowing that, you know, camera opera, cameramen are incredibly important and the operators uh, need to know what they're doing. Watch other productions. See how they articulate their camera. Listen to the professional announcers. In fact, Rick right here in this picture is in between Hall of Famer and former voice of the Pacers, Jerry Baker, and wow. um, Bob Lamy, current voice of the Colts. Interesting. So, uh, really cool picture there. Current voice of the Colts. Here's a great one, and something we're trying to help uh, anyone out there looking for a mentor is to find a mentor and ask questions. There's no book written about webcasting sports, so um, I believe Rick is very involved go. with Streaming Idiots Facebook group, the Webcasters Facebook group, and even actually is joining the PTZ Olympics user group Yay! as well, so we get a little bit more um, professional uh, broadcasters involved. But, um, you know, the Facebook groups are a great place mm -hmm. to start. For Absolutely. sure. And find Especially a mentor. getting feedback from your peers. Yes. Here's a couple more from, from Rick. Audio is very important. Don't waste, waste your efforts with poor audio or poor commentary. Put every webcast everywhere. Or put your webcast everywhere. If you're not everywhere, you're nowhere. Facebook, YouTube, OTT, webpage, Periscope. Couldn't agree more. Webcasting is by permission. You will need relationships with game owners or school. I'm mm -hmm. glad we covered that one. Yeah. Because if you go out there and you're broadcasting something that you're not allowed to do, don't say we didn't warn you. Now, when you're in K through 12, you're in high school, maybe even college, um, as long as you have a good rep relationship with the school and the coaches, mm -hmm. um, you know, you probably can go on a handshake. You might want to get something in writing. But what we're really talking about here is um, college level, um, you know, professional, professional level, D1, D2, minor league. minor league. Now, even some schools in some states, high school level sports can be very seriously mm -hmm. down south. Um, you know, you actually do need to work with the state and get contracts and pay down fees. Down south and up north. Yes. Uh, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't remember knowing, hearing anything about that in Pennsylvania, having to deal with No, but I picture contracts. hockey up north. Yeah, though, right. really serious. No, even high school level. So you have to be careful. I'm glad we mentioned it. Ask around, William, try to figure book it out. On the way. William's got a book on the way. I, there is a book Crazy. on this. That's good. And William, actually, we have some tips from William coming soon. There is a book on the way. And William, I'm glad that you said that because we're taking this video and we are advertising it because there's so much value here for people who are new. And we want to thank everyone who gave us their tips. Absolutely. And if, if you're willing to be a mentor, if you have a new book coming, let us know. Put it in the comments because people need to know about this stuff. Consider bond, bonded cellular internet solution like LiveView or Teradek Video Pro. Internet access will be problematic if you travel to produce, incorporate, purchase insurance. Let's show this off real quick because this is something I, I was so glad that this is actually coming from Rick, how important these are. So here is the LiveView Solo. I'm going to open it up really quickly. I'm guessing some people have never seen this. I had never seen or used this before, and now I got a chance to. Uh, we have an AT&T and a Verizon hotspot. And what it does is it bonds both cellular connections together and gives us an HDMI out input. So we come HDMI in from our broadcast switcher, and that's really it. It's got battery. You can plug it in if you'd like. You can even plug it into your Ethernet so that you're using your normal Ethernet. And you have your Wi-Fi as a backup. This mm. or Not Wi-Fi, 4G. And it can actually be tethered to your Wi-Fi as well. So it can bond hardwired Ethernet, Wi-Fi, two 4G hotspots. This is only $1,000. This is 
probably one of the most important things that sports broadcasters can invest in. This is your backup internet connection when all else fails, and it just it's just incredibly easy to use. The only tip I have with this is that these, when you start streaming and broadcasting, uh, they take a little time to g- gather the, um, what am I talking about, uplink. So it might say 300 kilobits, 500, 700, and it might take 30 seconds, 60 seconds to get up to like three to five megabits, which is really great quality. Um, so keep that in mind because in the very beginning, you're gonna, it could look pixelated. I found a way around it. If you stream directly to something like... Um, Anything that is in between you and the content delivery network, such as, I'm um, trying to think, Switchboard Live, mm-hmm. or any Easy Live, or some of the, there's one called Vid, Vid Expresso, uh, which does cloud-based um, streaming and redistribution. That will get rid of the pixelation in the very th- first 30 seconds of your broadcast, which unfortunately is an important part of your broadcast, because on the video on demand, when it's recorded, you don't want your very be- you know, first 60 seconds to be pixelated during your show. Live View knows about it, but Good the way the there. technology's built, it's kind of is what it Unavoidable. is. Unavoidable. So thank you for those 10 tips. Getting into William Warfield from PrepSpin, we've had him on our show, actually, and William has so many great tips. Um, he showed us how to do some wireless camera extensions with Ubiquity wireless routers. Mm-hmm. Um, remembering Mac. And he, sh- he is very active in streaming sports. It's one of his passions. And one of his first things here is focus on your audience and promote your stream on social media. Two keys to, I think, success Absolutely. here. Biased, um, we've had so much great information. I mean, focusing on your audience is key here. Um, we got, heard that from Chris. We're hearing it again from William. But also the, uh, the need for, for using social media, not trying to protect your stream, mm-hmm. which I've heard from some other people for some reason. But uh, we're hearing it over and over again from all these experts that use social media. Don't ignore it. It's, right. it's a tool in your shed. Rick's thanking us. Oh, great. Here's Rick. Rick is giving out his email address, so uh, thank you for doing that, Rick. Uh, The Webcasters Facebook page um, is a great place to learn more specifically about streaming sports. Now, if you're broadcasting high school sports, make it all about the kids in the community. Mm -hmm. Great. That's kind of what that audience would want anyways, I feel. Besides the benefit of, you know, looking back at the footage, what's it called? On Demand? No. Review? Uh, sports analytics? No, like uh, the coaches looking back at it. Oh, yeah. I could, all right, so the coaches, you know, reviewing it for analytic yeah, purposes. Yeah, that's called something that I can't think of that. And also scouting yeah. for college. And well, William and that's, talked about that. William did talk about that. And I'm glad How you it's mentioned it. For a lot of the kids. That was one of his big passion is that he's sometimes helping these students get into college because scouts can't go everywhere. Mm-hmm. And, you know, kids Especially can actually smaller get smaller towns. Oh, yeah. And there's one star player, but. You know, they never really get noticed or recognized. Now, putting it in available online, that gives the student who is ambitious, who's now got the recorded uh, video, to go out to colleges and say, here's my video of me streaming. Watch my game next week and watch it live. And that makes it even more real for the scout. Um, and that was a huge thing that William was proud of. Right. Next is build game your film. network. Game footage. Oh, game footage. Okay. Build your network as a community service rather than just your network. You really need to lead with passion and drive forward your purpose. I love that. Because, yes, you know, there is an opportunity to make a business out of all of this, but who are the people watching it? And, and, and they're the ones that we're doing this for. And with live streaming, there's the ability to create connections. You're not just watching it, your television at home. You're meeting other people with the same exact interest or purpose. They're there for a reason as yeah. you. So there's a lot of relationships that can form. And, and you mentioned that, Tess, and just to kind of add on to what you're saying here is that the transition between watching a show and joining the Facebook community or joining an online forum uh, is so much easier when it's a click of a button mm-hmm. as opposed to, a, you know, you're watching a television and it's just the next station and the next commercial. So it, that's such great advice, William. And then William's got one more here saying, college sports is a different animal because you're a small fish in a big pond. Focus on the things that set your broadcast apart. Connect with your audience by providing exclusive content. Mm -hmm. Realize that you're not ESPN with a million dollar budget, but you can still do what they do on a little budget. And we've heard, we heard that from Rick as well. We don't have footage of this, but we, we might have footage of this, but William has actually uses the vMix call 
with an Android phone, and he walks around. He's got Wi-Fi throughout the stadium, and he actually does crowd cams That's with a awesome. cell phone That's and awesome. brings them in. It's stuff like that. You can get really creative with it. And just the live communication that live streaming allows for with live streaming sports, just having people in your chat room talking about what just happened and how crazy that was as opposed to just sitting on their couch at home. It's special. It's a, it's, a different, it's a different experience. And I could see the stadiums wanting to bring people to the stadiums. You know, it's like churches who don't want to live stream their church service because they're worried that people might not come into the services. Mm -hmm. There might be a little bit of that coming on in minor league sports where they want to fill those seats and sell those tickets. So if you can do anything to make people still want to go and be on that game cam and show it on the big LED screen, all of that's going to help and promote you know, the whole ecosystem. So next we have, this is, our last um, tip. this is our last tip, vMix tip of the week. We wanted to give, we know a lot of vMix users out there. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the people uh, in, our, uh, in our user group, in the Streaming Idiots user group are using vMix. Don't forget to set is your that computer. that William's computer? Yes, and I wanted to share a couple pictures of it because he's pretty proud of it. Um, <laughs> don't forget to set your computer power settings to high performance. By default, power settings are set to balanced. We better check this on our computer, too. Not that we're having any issues. But um, this makes your computer run at a much less pace, and when on high performance mode, you might even drop frames. And when we're talking about streaming and recording in 60 frames per second, remember, that's twice as much video as 30 frames per second. That's a tip worth, worth writing down. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, William has more information about his uh, computer. I didn't write down all the specs, but it's pretty rad. 64 gigabytes of the, ra the latest Radon um, RAM and all kinds of stuff. But here's just a quick, and we're, we're, gonna, we're, we're getting you know, to the end of our broadcast here, but really quickly, um, here's a way that um, William was able to set up a wireless control for the camera. And if mm. you've got a camera out there, a PTZ Optics camera out in the field or out on the third baseline or the first baseline, you want to be able to control wirelessly, you can use ubiquity antennas and networks to create a mesh network where you can have the camera out in the field and you don't actually have to run uh, control cabling to it. Now, William is using HD-SDI um, to run the video in back, um, but he actually, for this camera in particular, I remember one of the tips that William shared with us is that a lot of scoreboards the way that they power them is over a fiber connection. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, since they have to dig down and use those, you can convert uh, HDSDI over fiber and use that fiber for a camera connection or a network connection. And that's what he was doing there. Uh, so we had a, my, uh, I'm, let's say, a mile long fiber connection uh, that was connected via HDSDI on either end and then had the wireless uh, control over the camera uh, over the ubiquity. Leave your computer running on the night before so any updates don't interfere with your show. It's happened to us before then. It's Happy face. Oh, it has happened to us. Now, uh, got a couple quick video clips. We, uh, we have a video clip of the camera outdoor enclosure coming from Christopher Sabato. So many, all right, I'm going to let it play. Oh, so many um, of, you, of the sports are happening outdoors. And if it rains, you don't want your equipment to get wet. Maybe you're permanently putting a camera outside. So let's take a look at this quick video. Um, here's, this is actually just a PTZ Optics camera on a tripod when we were live streaming um, some, some high school level sports, um, some football. But I have another one here. Here's a zoom test. I wanted to show just, this is what a 20X zoom looks like. Um, from a soccer, uh, in, in a soccer be fall, soccer ball, about, <laughs> field and ball, about f at the halfway, uh, halfway down the, um, the field. Look at that kid's little stretch dance. <laughs> so just, just to give you an idea of what you can zoom in on, I just wanted to share that. Is he dabbing? <laughs> yeah, I think he is. is. <laughs> it's just a funny little clip. Uh, I haven't done enough sports streaming myself. I, I want to do a lot more, but I think there's another clip now. We're getting into cl clip frenzy here. What else do we have? Okay, this is the professional level. Um, this is the New York Brooklyn Legion. And this is them live streaming sports with three PTZ Optics 20X SDI wow. cameras. And you see how they, they're using the pan, the very slow pan. Everything is, is very well zoomed out. They did some tight shots. Um, you can see it feels a little bit robotic. 
But they're trying to cut costs and they don't want to pay union cameramen mm -hmm. that cost like $100 an hour per camera. Right. They can have one person. Honestly, they had all three cameras remotely controlled, so they weren't paying any union men. Here is a little bit more of a, a more zoomed in shot. This is professional level soccer using PTZ optics cameras be done by Be Terrific. And they were actually using the Live View solos to beam all of the video back to a production studio. So, um, Does the dome lessen the resolution at all in the dot works? Mm, I would have to ask Christopher Sabato that, some of the people that have used it, but I don't think as so. As long as it's clean, I would think that the okay. image would this be has audio, right? So, uh, okay. It's like very echoey. All right. Yeah. Okay. So um, this is inside of the um, dot works enclosure. There are two weather tight cable entries on the right hand side and then the camera is snugly um, mounted to a mounting plate there and uh, you can see he's got camera control and video and then I believe he's sending power over Ethernet um, you can also have audio there and um, it's completely weather tight and weather sealed there is space in there for what's called a heater blower and what that right. does is if there's condensation because of precipitation that was our show together what was what's that? Mike and I did that live demo with the doctor. Oh, yeah, you guys did that show together. <laughs> um, so we have a couple different videos on how this works, um, and all the part numbers are on our website. But And that there um, actually mounts to um, a gigantic tripod from U.S. Sports. Hmm. And there's the, there's the connector there. So let's show some pictures of that. Okay, wait, let's show this. Okay, so this is Hewitt. Hewitt Clinic. The lighting is... Beautiful. Clink. Lighting is in, what is it? Clink. Clink. You at clinic. So I think this is, if it's not professional level soccer in the Netherlands, it's minor league. But take a look at this tripod, the size of it. Look how high up the tripod gets. There's the camera there. So he's, he's about 20, 25 feet up in the, in the sky with his, with his tripod. Maybe even 30 feet. Um, and those giant tripods, uh, some of these giant speaker stands are being used to broadcast. Now, it was just two weeks ago, we had a whole show on tripods. And if you're going out and you're doing these mobile setups, these tripods are really important. I think that's, yeah. is that pretty much that one? Yeah. Um, that's what he was using that there. Was and then here's Joe Calabrese using, um, I, I forget what he called this, but it's basically a giant metal beam that's raised into the air. And they actually put the cameras on this metal beam they had, I guess they said it's six cameras and eight Sonys, and they put them on these metal beams to live stream the, um, the Olympic sports. There's a picture of them there. And that's them using vMix. There's the Xbox controllers. There's the X keys. Nice little uh, behind the scenes look. At the U.S. Olympic team trials current. Trussing. Trussing, that's what it's called. Duh, right? I can't believe we forgot that. So, I mean, I think that, I'm trying to think, I think there's some final picture photo credits we have to give out. Oh, um, I just wanted to show everybody's setup that they shared with us. Yeah, so, so really quickly, the Willamette Bearcats uh, broadcast. Here's a couple pictures of the, um, oh yeah, there's a couple pictures of the soccer. Um, here's a couple pictures of, that's, that's, um, that's, that tripod is incredible. And then. It's the biggest tripod I've ever seen. Yeah, that tripod is insane. And, uh, Chris got it from, I believe, it's called U.S. Sports Video. Basketball streaming, here's a couple pictures of this. And this is when Chris got into something really interesting using the PTZ Optics Producer Kit and the New Tech NDI in a very creative way to bring in the shot clock over the network. And you can see here that he actually used um, an NDI camera, or a camera over the network using New Tech Connect Pro app to pull in. You can see there's the shot clock there. And he basically used a camera over an Ethernet cable with effectively zero latency uh, and then just cropped them in. Ah. So he cropped the, the, sh the timer and the shot clock into his scoreboard. Very but smart. Did, I'm guessing he probably powered the score himself. Mm -hmm. Every time they scored, he'd put two or three more points there. But um, the shot clock and the camera, the, so that way he had no, didn't need to manage at all the clock himself. Nice. Um, 
to really getting close here. Just a couple last pictures. There's there's his little. Uh, it really is just a one two person setup. Maybe three with a cameraman. Um, Here's a picture, couple pictures from Ken. Didn't want to forget his high school sports streaming and his camera. Um, he's got six cameras there and, and the replay and everything. Um, big thanks to everyone who helped us out with this from our Facebook user group. And here's just a couple more shout outs. We've got some pictures from Andrew Seabrook. Um, this is everybody that shared in the user group Ken Ricker, Richer, mm -hmm. Eric Himes, Dominic Mueller. Mm, this is a tricky one, this name. Matuz Lamiesco. <laughs> I'm trying my best. But it's so fun to see, you know, everybody's different setups and a lot of the times how they have the kids controlling all the cameras. That gets me really excited. Yeah. And finally, we have Scott Dupler and Nikolai Kanik. And, oh, there's another one from Ken. So this is another one of those giant beam trusses from Scott Dupler mm. that he's mounting it the same way that Joe the did. Trusses, yeah. Thank you guys so much for helping us out with this and participating in this. And we hope that you found this helpful and that you learned a lot about live sports streaming today. I did. Yeah, I learned so much from this. I'm so happy that you're all here. Why don't we um, play the outro? That was one of our longest Back to Basics ever. Yeah. But we maybe hang out for just we a little bit for Q&A. We started and they were supposed to be 10 minutes. I know. Um, we can't help ourselves. We'll hang out for a little bit of Q&A over in our pr producer chairs here. Mm -hmm. But let's roll the credits. Yes, Thank you I so much down. for coming along, it's guys. Yeah. here. Whew. Thanks, guys. Okay, and we're back. Um, just checking out the chat, hanging out to see if here. there's any final questions. Um, but I think we did a great job explaining some of the most important basic questions for streaming sports. Yeah, we got a lot of great feedback and input Thanks, from Dan. the chat today. So we really appreciate that for you guys. From you guys. A lot of people like the sports talk today. Yeah, there's a lot of sports broadcasters. Yes, that's a lot of our user group is, is taken up by sports. Next week, we're going to dig into uh, green screens and okay. virtual sets. Sounds and good. then we're going to probably do one on tips for house of worship. Yes, I want to do one on house of worship, maybe healthcare, education. Let us know in the user group if you're part of an industry that you'd like to see us cover all the different uses for and tips that we've come up with. So it's been a long show. If, um, if there's not too many more questions, uh, we'll, we'll cut it off there. Thank you so much, Gene. I owe you an email. Uh, we got we to <laughs> chat about iMag is definitely one that Gene's going to help Everybody's us. Everybody's always asking us about that, too. Yeah, we, I want to do one on iMag soon. We're yeah. going to do green screens, maybe then iMag. Because iMag, we might even get more iMag questions than green screens. Yeah. Got to prioritize what the people want. <laughs> get the people what they want. Sports is a good way to get into live streaming. And thank you guys so much. Sorry about that, Mike. Don't forget to like the button, to click the like button for this show. We hope that you naturally like it and are, are uh, geared towards doing that. But Tom, thanks for reminding me. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you like the kind of stuff that we're doing and you want to see more. Yes, of course. Um, we're also looking for studios to interview. Oh, so changing you have light studio, conditions. That was the one unanswered. Oh, not sure if it was answered, but how do you handle changing light conditions? That's a good question. So, um, you know, a lot of broadcasters will leave their cameras on automatic, and then others will um, constantly change the yeah, iris and for shutter us, speed. It was bad as time goes on, like every two hours, you, we had to adjust the lighting yeah. when we did that. Automatic um, can be very difficult um, because. Uh, the camera's in charge. Mm -hmm. So uh, what we like, what I would say to do is you would do shutter speed priority because you know that you're going to do 60 frames a second if, you, if that's what you're going for. And you probably want to lock in that shutter speed at 1 120th of a second. And then it will only do automatic aperture. 
Mm. Um, and you can usually trust that pretty well, or you can just change the aperture and leave your shutter speed the same, and so you only really have to worry about the iris. And if you're using remotely controlled PTZ optics cameras, there's an iris plus and minus button on the joystick. Mm -hmm. So if you've got the shutter speed where you want it, you've got the white balance where you like it, uh, everything's tuned in with the, with the color temperature. And I think Mike's got a, something to add. Uh, I was going to say, um, I would think it'd be really interesting if there's a piece of software or remix came up where you got to input all your cameras. You pick the camera that has the best lighting or view, and then the, the software automatically changes it. I all. know. Everyone's been asking for vMix to do some c color matching. Yeah, Technically, New Tech has a, has a way to do that with the New Tech Connect Pro app, actually. I've seen it done. We, we talked about it on the show briefly. It's automatic. Uh, it basically basically puts what's called a LUT over all of the cameras, mm -hmm. so they all kind of have a similar feel mm -hmm. by changing the gamma. You get filtered. Um, I think there's more coming, and I think NDI is going to probably bring um, some of those tools to the table, which is why we're so excited. Um, John, that was the Live U Solo, and does the Live U Solo work in the UK and Europe? Yeah, so because the, the way it works is that you purchase the 4G hotspots locally to where you're going to be, and then it will always work. So if you're in Mexico, you have to buy the 4G Mexico hotspots. If you're in you know, Europe, you just buy those. So it, doesn't it doesn't know any different. It's just whatever is being plugged in. Mm -hmm. All right, guys, thank you so much, and we will see you next time. Take care, everybody. Bye. Thanks for joining.